am so incredulous that so many people have turned up for such an early start on a Friday morning. And I can see some familiar faces in the audience and it's absolutely lovely to welcome you back. For those of you who don't know me, I'm Wendy Kerr and I have the absolute pleasure and privilege to be the director for the Centre of Innovation and Entrepreneurship at the Auckland Business School, which is obviously part of Auckland University. Our mission at the Centre for Innovation and Entrepreneurship is to unleash the spirit of innovation and entrepreneurship across all staff and students at Auckland University. And we do this because we want to transform their mindsets so that together that they can build a more prosperous and creative New Zealand economy. We have had an astounding feedback and an astounding result today to get so many people in the room. And clearly the topic is hitting a chord with all of you. And I know that we've gone to many conferences and panels and discussions about disruption, Uber this, Airbnb this, and I think some of us are a bit tired of the same old rhetoric around what innovation and disruption is. So today I hope that you are enlightened by a gritty panel discussion from people who have been there and done it. So I'd love to know, a show of hands, how many of you are working in corporates who are struggling with innovation? Okay, just a few. And how many of you are working in firms that want to help corporates about innovation? That's more like it. So we've got a good blend of people who need help and people who want to help. If we're thinking about innovation, how do we do it? Do we bring in some consultants and they do innovation for our company? Do we make everyone an innovator in the company? Or do we buy some groovy startup and just hope that that vibe spreads through the organization and that's our innovation solution? So today we have four panelists who have been experts in the field of innovation and made some significant changes in all of their organizations. And you're gonna hear from them today about how they've done it and what they've learned from it. So every panelist will speak for five minutes and then after they've spoken, we'll open up the floor for questions. So first of all, we have Lee Angus and she's the Head of Innovation and Commercialization at ASB Bank. She has a stellar career of really innovating globally. She's worked with large corporates, with research labs, universities and commercialization units in Israel, China, Australia and now we're lucky enough to have her in New Zealand. So we've all seen the innovation that ASB has done and Lee's going to share with us her experiences there and around the world. So thank you, Lee. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Sorry, can you hear me all right? I'm a little croaky in the voice. You'll have to excuse me. I commute back and forth between Australia and New Zealand. So every time I get on a plane, I, I tend to bring the Australian kind of strain over here and then the New Zealand one back over there. So you'll have to excuse me. Um, so, uh, yeah, I've had a, um, I, I guess it's a, it's a rather um, a, a strange and wonderful uh, last 15, 20 years in uh, innovation um, and have done it in all sorts of environments. Um, uh, Wendy's alluded to a lot of it in terms of research environments as well as corporates, but um, I also bear the bruises of, of having startups of my own. Um, and, uh, and have one at the moment that's been um, going for about three years now and it's reasonably successful but it's taken me about the fifth one to get there. Um, so I, I have a, a rather empathetic heart for um, startups and entrepreneurs and founders trying to get businesses off the ground because essentially it's hard, hard work. Um, so in terms of corporate innovation, I'm, I'm on my, I guess my third gig of corporate innovation. Um, I did tech transfer for a university for about four years, which was in licensing research and, and new intellectual property and emerging technologies into large corporate environments. And then on the other side, I, I did a, a period of time with Domino's in Australia, um, which is the ASX listed company that has multiple territories across the, um, the world. Uh, I, had, I did seven months there in what is the quick service industry and it was brutal um, in the sense of just how fast they operate, how quick they need to go to market um, and, and also I guess just as a culture it's a really challenging industry. Um, and then more recent times now, almost a year in with ASB um, in banking and finance which is a completely different kind of sector again so it's, um, it's been a really interesting journey. And, I guess I'll just talk to a few of the differences perhaps around what I've seen from say a Domino's environment to an ASB environment. 
Um, and some of the things that we've done really well to perhaps some of the things where we've kind of tripped up and, and need to learn from them. But um, So Domino's is an intriguing company in the sense that it is a five billion company. Um, the share price dropped recently, so I suspect it's down to about four now. Um, but a five billion company that is still run by one of the original founders of the Australian Territory. So Domino's is a US brand and then it's licensed out as a franchisee. Um, but the original Domino's person in Australia, Don May, who's probably, I think he's sitting around 45 years of age, was originally a driver, pizza driver, um, you know, flipping the pies, getting them out the door. So it comes from grassroots and he's built that business up from in the Australian Territory to New Zealand, Japan, Belgium, Netherlands, France, Germany, um, and um, the Principality of Monaco, which is quite intriguing. I'm, I'm just not quite sure what their pizzas look like. They're a bit gold crusted. Um, so he's gone from one store, working as a pizza delivery guy, one store to now what is 1,700 stores, and inherently operates like a founder of a startup. You know, gets a flash of an idea from an instinctual um, stomach, you know, in the gut, got to do this, and runs hard and fast for the opportunity. And the whole business runs with him re really, really quickly. And they pride themselves on first, first <coughs> to everything, first on everything, first to pizza tracker, first to autonomous robotic units, first to, um, you know, drone deliveries, um, first to everything. So they, they really, really run fast. It's a hard paced environment. It was a great experience in the sense that um, Don, when he wants the business to move, the business moves, and it moves really, really fast. So if he wants something done, and it ignites his interest and his passion, it gets done immediately. Um, and, and you know, I think that's half of the success of the business, is the sense that you do have this really entrepreneurial person at the top of it, um, driving the business. So, you know, when Don wakes up and says, we are going to do autonomous deliveries, make it happen, it happened within months. And actually, Drew, which was Domino's robotic unit that we put on the ground, first ever in the industry, um, we had that project built, delivered, pro you know, the prototypes, it wasn't a full one, but a prototype delivered working through all of the legislative problems and challenges within about three and a half months. So it was a remarkable speed and he just kept the accelerator, you know, going, go, 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 go. So on that side, you have you know this really really um, fast moving environment, excellent fun, but really taxing. You know, and, and within seven months, burnt out. Cannot live like this. This is not a, a world that I can kind of keep up pace with. Um, moving to ASB, you have a far more traditional business, um, a far more reserved and conservative approach. But in the same sense, you also have this beautiful kind of considered way of thinking about our customers and our markets and where we're delivering and the strategy. Sometimes it gets a little frustrating because it's much slower, the wheels turn a little slower, but you know that it's not a flash in the pan idea from someone who's woken up one morning and said, we are going in that direction. You know it's a considered direction where the whole ship is going and it's moving at a reasonable pace to get there. And it's taking into account all of the people on board of that boat that need to be involved with it. So um, a very different experience and then of course run by um, a CEO who has been born and bred in a corporate environment and understands you know, the frameworks that she needs to work in and, and steers the boat in a really well considered manner. So very, very different environment. But not any less, with any less appetite for change and innovation and speed as dominoes. Just a very, very different kind of approach. So I've actually, I've had more success and have been well received within ASB than I ever was in dominoes because innovation isn't a flash in the pan idea. It's a full comprehensive strategy. It's cultural change. It's a mindset that needs to be kind of filtered out right across the business, not in pockets of one or two people. You know, people have to kind of appreciate that if a business is going to be innovative, it's the whole of the business that's innovative. Because innovation doesn't happen in isolation. It doesn't happen in pockets. It's not individuals. It takes a whole tribe to get really good, game-changing ideas from a thought bubble to implementation. So, um, so we're developing an ASB uh, a number of strategies uh, to, to kind of um, continue our journey of being front foot on innovation and to continue the proof points that 
um, people associate with the brand as being innovative. And those strategies range from anything from um, programs for entrepreneurship and education and training for our people to outreach to universities and to startups and engagement models that make sense for all the parties um, to uh, funding mechanisms to making innovation transparent and also to make it profitable um, so you know I'm, I'm currently now putting ourselves in as a PL so that anything we put our hand to over a period of time three, four, five years, we can point to the returns of our investment early on in the stage to say, well, we, you know, that's where, that's where we contributed to where now the returns come back to us, that we are almost becoming a self-sustaining machinery within ASB itself. And also, we've got the legs to stand up and say, well, actually, look at the dollars. It's not just the pretty ideas. We don't just do sticky post-it notes on walls. We actually return the <coughs> investment of our activities and our effort over time but it's a long-term play. So as you can appreciate, all of you are, or some of you are in corporates, quarterlies matter for everything. Um, you know, every three months, everyone is kind of under pressure on delivering on numbers. So, so anyone in innovation, you know, has to kind of hold solid because it is a long-term and it, and it means a bit of bruising, it means being kind of tough and robust and kind of being prepared to be questioned and challenged constantly because a lot of the work that we're doing now we may well not see any effect for another three, four, five years. Because innovation takes time. It takes a lot of people, it takes time. Particularly the innovation that I like, which is really the industry changing, the game changing stuff. And when you do that, it's not just employees involved. It tends to be governments involved because there's policy changes that are needed in place. There tends to be capital involved in some way in terms of someone who's putting in significant investment. If it's not the corporate, it's someone else. There tends to be entrepreneurs involved in gravitating around that as well because there's you know this spark of new ideas coming in from other people. There tends to be good, solid research, science, technology underpinning it as well. That's the fundamental innovation that I really, really love. And that's one sort of I, I kind of grapple with on a regular day to show how it's sort of delivering off on what is a bank delivering quarter by quarter, um, year by year. I'll leave you with that. Thank you very much, Lee. Um, next we have Chris Quinn, who is the CEO of Foodstuffs North Island Limited. And in fact, it was a conversation I heard uh, Chris having at the Ice House board meeting, of which he and I are both um, on the board of, in fact, Chris is the chair, around corporate innovation and what is a different way to do it that really sparked this idea in my mind to have a panel discussion about it. So thanks for that. Chris, um, before he joined Foodstuffs, led a very successful rebrand of Telecom to Spark, and I think we can all see what an incredible rebrand that was and what a massive success that's been. In July 2010, he also received the Emerging Leader Award at the annual Sir Peter Blake Leadership Awards, and he's also received the Chairman's Award of the 2010 Two Ends Innovation Awards. And as I said, he is the chair of the Ice House Board, a role that he really relishes. So thank you, Chris. Thank you, Wendy. And look, uh, good morning. Uh, and fascinating listening already to the stories around the room. You know, after 24 years in an industry that was forced to innovate very, very often, because there's not many industries where you spend $500 million a year in capital to have your revenue go backwards slowly every year. Uh, you know, and telco is an incredible, you know, in some ways value-destroying industry. I think it would rival airlines uh, in many ways. So you, you go from there to an organisation that is now 95 years old in New Zealand, uh, that you, you could argue easily the last innovation foodstuffs did was the establishment of the Pack and Save brand in New Zealand. And that's quite exciting when you think about it until you remember that it's 32 years old. Uh, you know, so the, the organisation has been incredibly successful by changing very little and being very careful for a very long time. Uh, and when you stand back and look at an organisation that turns over $7.5 billion a year in the North Island alone, uh, has 1.3 million customers a week going through the stores. And in fact, the, the number I keep thinking about is 500,000 transactions a day. So anything you plan to do, you sort of have this little thing at the back of your mind that says don't screw that up uh, because the multiplier effect is rapid. Uh, and you know, so you look at all of that and go, how do you think about innovation in that and how do you, you pull some of the learnings together? I think the subject, which was why do corporates find innovation so hard is fascinating in itself because I think it has a bias in it that assumes corporates find it hard. 
uh, and I'll talk a little bit about observations between startups and corporates and the attitudes, actually. Uh, one overriding thing for me is, you know, it's not innovative if no one buys it. Uh, and I think that's a really, you know, there's a lot of innovation and a lot of tension around innovation that people have in their minds because they just go, I love my idea. And that's cool as long as you're not the only one. And, and that's the, the thing that we just keep thinking about in terms of innovation is how do you make sure there is a customer base for it that is valuable for someone. When I stand back and go, what's hard about innovations, particularly in larger organisations and corporates? Uh, the first one is if you've got no system, no framework of innovation. It was great you know, hearing about the extent to which ASB are thinking about that. And I think many of us would say that's probably been the technology brand lead bank in New Zealand for a long time. You can see why. Uh, no courage. So no, no you know, courage to stand up and have something fail and be okay about that. Uh, no crisis. You know, you know, it sort of goes with the other one, which is if you are too successful as an organisation, innovation's hard because there is this serious overlay of don't fuck it up. Um, you know, and that, that slows people down a lot around innovation. Uh, the other one is don't, you don't know your customers. You know, organisations that don't deeply know and understand their customers and the insight find innovation very hard because the innovation comes from customers. You know, customers will force innovation far quicker than any technology. Uh, and just deeply understanding not only what customers do in your organisation or your value chain, but why they do it and what is driving them is the critical thing. Any organisation with a below the line culture or blame culture, innovation is really hard because everyone's hunting for someone to fail and pick them out real quick. And the last bit that I think is hard about corporate innovation is many startups' attitude to corporates. Uh, working, you know, being on the team at the Ice House has been great because you just, you know, you are reminded weekly about what it's like to run a business that is struggling to pay next week's wages bill. Uh, then you go back to the safe blanket of decent revenue and decent earnings and it's just a nice dichotomy to keep working with. I've seen, you know, several startups, you know, every organisation you go to, you get them chasing in and presenting their idea and going, you know, your, your company is dead if you don't buy my startup. And you go, well, maybe. Um, you know, and, and I saw one on social media leading into a, a, a thing we had where they said, oh, you know, I'm sick of these corporates, they're just full of fat, lazy, middle-aged managers who've never worked a day in their life. And I thought, I am looking forward to your pitch. Um, <laughs> you know, uh, and, and when they pitched, I said, just tell me a little bit about that. Um, uh, you know, and it's just, there is, we see it all the time, right? So food industry, I, I have New Zealand fantastic, clever, interesting New Zealand startups show up with products. Uh, and they show up and, and, you know, they sort of go, I've got this thing, and it's amazing, and it is. And they go, my problem is I just can't get it immediately ranged into your stores. And you go, well, yeah, d you know, just think for a minute. You know, when you're turning over what we do a year, when you have 450 stores, it probably needs to go into a system so it goes bleep at the checkout. And I know that sounds frustrating to you as a startup, but if you want the big prize, you know, you've got to actually understand your customer. And one of the biggest pieces of advice I try and give them is think about the time you put into pitching for investment. Would it be worth putting about the same amount of time pitching into a big customer? Because they generally are massively out of balance on that. And the most powerful thing any startup can tell a potential investor is we've got this customer. So observations or things to get right about innovation in larger organisations. The first one is strength of customer insight. You've got to know it, regularly update it, talk about it all the time and have all of your people spending time out in front of customers. You know, we did a little thing where we rebranded our private label stuff and I, I spent uh, about 10 days, two hours a day in stores talking to customers who had the previous brand stuff in their trolleys and just going, oh, tell me about that. You know, it was a thing called budget and you found out that customers would only buy it if it was buying for a church event, a social event, a school event, a sports event. They would never buy it for their own cupboards because it made them feel bad. Right? It wasn't hard to work out what to do, right? you know, so innovate the brand fast. Um, you know, understanding that 50% of our revenue will come from millennials and Gen Z uh, within five years, and you stand back and go, how many of them watch TV or read our newspaper ads? You know, just, so just really understanding customers intimately and talking about a lot. Um, the second thing is having owner's mindset in the business. So the Domino story is, you know, fantastic in terms of the owner's mindset living through a lot, quite a large organisation. We have it, we have 450 of them. They would call themselves innovators, I'd call some of them off the planet. Um, but, you know, the, the, the everyday innovation that goes on, you know, when you have a model like a lower like co-op or a franchise, every day they can walk out and make a change in store, try it, measure it, try again. So that very fast cycle innovation is actually core in the culture. It's just how do you bring it right up through. Uh, and diversity in teams is critical, absolutely critical. I mean proper diversity, diversity of style and thought and, and uh, mindset, you know, as well as gender, race, culture. 
but, it, but if you've got that, then you're going to get ideas that you would not have thought of because of your context. So constantly finding that diversity and tapping it. Uh, and leaders really matters, you know, like you have to have leadership tolerant of innovation and tolerant of failure, actually, that goes with it. Uh, you've got to partner or acquire disruption. I know, Wendy, you mentioned, you know, should we just buy a startup to work with? And I, I agree, that's a dangerous thing to do because quite often you just kill a startup. Um, <clears throat> but, but what you should be doing is working out how to partner with, how to be challenged by. And the example Wendy mentioned, so we recently, you know, the, the meal kit category has gone big in New Zealand. My food bag and others have done a fantastic job. They've established a category and a need. So we decided we needed to play hard into the category. You know, the normal process in our business, nine to 12 months at least to get out. So we partnered through Ice House with an entrepreneur, basically set it up that way where we gave them an allocation of cash and said, you've got this much cash to get to this point in terms of market development. Uh, and then if you're on target, we'll, we'll cash flow you again. If you're not, we'll stop. Right, and that gave them the permission to do it all the ways that made sense and to try stuff that we would not have naturally tried inside the organisation. The team was made up 50-50, so 50% of people who knew how we worked but had the right mindset, 50% of externals, and they just go at it and come back to us about once a month with an update to an advisory board. Right, and it's, it's worked. We've now got a product market shifting about 500 units a week across six stores, and we're ready to sort of go bigger. So it's you know, been a nice example for us. Uh, you've got a budget to fail, so you have to fund innovation somehow. Right? It has to have a return. And what we're trying to get to is a mindset that basically says we need to save twice as much as we spend on innovation. So just constantly thinking, because innovation's risky. Not everything's going to work and pay off, so we just we try and think about that. Uh, and you know, Fresh Collective, which is a brand we just launched, um, you, you know, if you followed the little innovation path, Overseas research, understanding your customer insight deeply, open the first one on the North Shore and Constellation Drive, change it about 100% for the second one in Alberton, and the third one will sort of be better again. And this is happening in about 8 to 12 week cycles, which is quite different for us. And it's off customer feedback, so it's just constantly asking customers what they think, being in store with them, listening, watching. Right? And the original prototype of that we did in an old Foursquare and Panmure by the roundabout, uh, where we stripped the building out and basically built polystyrene store inside. It's like walking on the moon in there, it's weird. Um, but, but we had hundreds of people go through it and just go, what do you think, what do you think, where would you push, put this, where would you move that? And that was the sort of design process, it wasn't 2D drawings, it was a 4D experience that we learned from. And you could change quickly. Uh, and the last thing I'd say about success is you've got to harness the organisation somehow. Any attitude that says you're in the non-innovative part of the company, you know, it, it's a really cool conversation to have with people, right? Um, so you've just got to say everybody can contribute, everybody can chip in. You have to have a framework for gathering their ideas, showing them you've heard them, and quickly responding. You know, and the response quite often will be no, not right for us or doesn't fit, or yes, we're going to get behind it, this is what we're going to do. And, but you've got to have that framework. So, a few thoughts on how to make it work. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Chris. That was absolutely fascinating. Um, now we have Dawn Namo, and she is the Director of Innovations and Ventures at PwC. Now, Dawn calls herself a self-disruptor. Now, I've not met anyone who's called themselves a self-disruptor, but she has a lot of experience of startups and corporate businesses, and certainly moving into PwC, she's seen a whole different culture in terms of how they're innovating and what they're doing with their clients. I don't actually remember calling myself a self-disruptor, um, but I guess that lends to my personality, which is as I get different information and inputs, then I am a person that will change. So I love feedback. And so as I'm talking, I'm gonna be looking at your faces to see if I'm hitting the point or not. And we've had some really um, great points about innovation so far. And what I want to do is not reiterate those, but maybe look at it in a slightly different way. And if we go back to the subject of why is it hard for corporates to do innovation, I think we need to look at corporates itself. And I'm going to be very general because I can't talk about specifics. Um, we don't have enough time. But when we look at a corporate, uh, we visualize a certain type of company. So it's large, it's got a lot of hierarchy in it, there's a lot of people involved. And I think when we look at that at a level down and understand what that hierarchy brings and what it means to manage so many people, 
they are really, really internally focused because they've got to get everybody doing the same vision. Yeah. And they introduce hierarchy because they've got to get that communication going in all the different uh, levels. And what that does is it creates a really big challenge for somebody or creating innovation internally because you've got a set of people who are absolutely amazing at what they do on a daily basis and you're asking them to change. You're asking them to do something different to what they do every day and they've been told in the past, you have built our success. You have made us be the large corporate that we are today, but now I need you to change that. I need you to do something different. That's super frightening. That's really scary for those people. And so when you go to them and go, okay, we're gonna be an innovative company now, that has little meaning to them. What will happen is these barriers will come up and they'll be like, oh my God, oh my God, I have to stop doing what I do. What do I do now? And so when Chris was talking about how um, you need to have it in all parts of the business, that's what it is. You need to not only have an amazing, strong vision like the Domino's guy, but you also need to have the outcomes that you want, but the path in between. And that's where people get lost. It's like, okay, we can talk at this really, really high level, and we know this is what we want at the end of it, but how do I get there? How do I go from that to that? And that's what my speciality is, and that's what we're attempting to do inside the Innovation Hub at PwC. And I totally agree that innovation is not for one area. And so we've taken that on board, and even though we're a single group, and I know that in, in our area, inside PwC, they look at us and they're like, <laughs> those innovation people, oh, just as well they're doing it. We have to focus on doing our daily stuff. We have to operate the company. We have to get the money in. They're just going to spend it. <laughs> so what we do is we're very conscious of that and we try and make our contact points with the other people in the business really human. And so we're talking to them in the context of what it is in their role. And we show them what's possible. And we show them what's possible by prototyping, by talking to customers, by bringing external views into the company and show them so that they can make a decision, they can think about it. They're the specialist in their role. There's no way that I can come into the business and go, this is the way you should be doing your job from now on. But what I can do is go, hey, these are some tools. This is a different way to think about it. This is potentially a different lens. How would you apply it against your job today? And by doing that, that then gives them a slight jolt, but a safe one, to go, oh, oh actually, maybe I don't have to do it in Excel anymore. Maybe there's another way to do what I do today. And I think that's a really important um, thing to note when you're trying to change an organisation um, and allow it to be more innovative, is that you have to take into consideration what the business model is. You have to take into consideration the people that are inside that organisation. You have to plan for change, and Chris definitely outlined that, and I just want to underline it. And that is, you have to plan for it from an executive level, level, from the middle management level to the daily operations level. If there isn't a plan all the way through your business, you'll just get pockets and you'll end up with lots and lots of ideas, but they never get to fruition. They'll never see the light of day. And so it's really important that if you're going into an organisation to say, hey, we know how to solve the innovation problem for you. We know how we're going to disrupt you. You need to make sure that you have the buy-in through the whole company, not just one area. And I know from my past that um, I have had some success and some failures where you go in and you, you know everything. And you go in there and you're like, oh, I know how to do this. You, this is wrong, this is wrong, this is wrong, and this is wrong. You need to change this, you need this technology, it's done, sweet. Just go and do it now. And when you do that, you're just handing over a whole lot of stuff. 
but it's not contextualizing it to that particular company and that is really important and that goes to understand your client or understand your customers if you're doing it internally so by understanding you can provide the context by providing context you're providing a path and so I would say those are my key points. Yeah, Great. thank you. Thank you very much, Dawn. That was a really interesting lens on it to give us a broader perspective of what innovation can be for different companies. And I think there was something in what she said about it is about change and it's about the people. So next up, we have Nikki Rystrick, who is the uh, Group General Manager of Digital at Fletcher Building. Now, she leads a team of 36 businesses across 40 markets globally. So can you imagine what it's like to innovate across that span of cultures, time zones, and everything else that comes with an organisation of that size? In 2015, Nikki established a digital innovation lab that creates innovate, innovative digital products and has delivered $7 million in EBIT over the last two years. So I think there's proof that innovation can be profitable. Innovation means a lot of different things to different people. I think if I asked each of you what innovation meant to you, I think that I'd get a, a different definition for every single person in this room, am I right? For, for me, innovation means delivering value, but in a bold way. But there's a scale, right? So you've got innovation from the micro-innovation all the way through disruption. And I think this is why it gets confusing for people around why corporates can't innovate in terms of a perception, because I, I don't believe that's true. I've been involved with corporates that have been innovating <coughs> right from the very first point in my career when I was a founding employee for Extra. And that was a, a massive change, not, for, not just for telecom, but for New Zealand as a whole. It was in the early days of putting the internet in the hands of every person in New Zealand. And that was really interesting because when we first started our business case for Extra was to get 100,000 people online in our first year. Who knows how many we got in the first year? A million people online in our first year. And that was the start of a massive transformation for New Zealand in terms of getting online. And I've been involved in a few different companies over the course of my career. I worked for Canon in Europe. And we invested in a little startup that created a, a technology that enabled you to save your photos from your camera online so that you would have access to them. This was in about 2002. And now look at your photo sharing online. You know, it's everywhere. And that organisation that we invested in wanted to create a cloud hosting service. And we built that, and it was fantastic. And then Amazon launched into the market, so we had to close it down. So innovation is also about timing. It's creating the value, but at the right time, with the right customer, and really understanding what your customers want as well. When I returned to New Zealand four years ago, I was lucky enough to reconnect with a lot of my extra colleagues who had, were starting Spark Ventures. Rod Snodgrass um, was someone I worked with at Extra. And I joined that team at the start of Spark Ventures and over the course of that first year we established five businesses into the market of which all are still operating. Now there's, a, you know, you can look at that in a number of different ways but for an uh, organisation to spin up five businesses in a year is quite an achievement. But the other thing that's really lasting about that organisation is we introduced new ways of working, the culture of, of working, connecting with customers, understanding your customers, bringing that insight <coughs> into your organisation, and then working in an agile, iterative, lean, customer-centric way to bring those ideas to life. And then I moved from there working for, for a bank and looking at, well, how can you innovate in a, a bank and actually bring that customer insight into your strategy. And we worked with, for four months to understand you know, what should the future branch footprint look like based on the, the, the changing natures of customer needs? What should the interior of that look like? And how do you integrate the online and offline world within a, in a branch footprint? And that was a really fun piece of work. And then at Fletcher's, now there's a that very kind introduction um, around what we've achieved at Fletcher's. But you know, the thing that's really made a difference at Fletcher's is the cultural change. 
when I started there two and a half years ago and I started talking about digital, I may as well be talking another language. And it's like, what, what's all this stuff you're talking about? How is this relevant? And I'm like, well, how are you getting your orders into your business? Oh, well, 50% of them are coming in by fax or on a piece of wood or on a piece of jib, or, you know, or they just come and in, rock into the branch and say, oh, I need this. And how is that really helping you be efficient in having the right conversations with your customers when you're just dealing with this, you know, huge wads of paper everywhere and you get your cement dust and your rain and, and you know, you can imagine what, what that's like, you know. And so it's been a fantastic opportunity to be working at Fletcher's. It's a built-in ecosystem of businesses, 36 different businesses all doing different things, going in different directions, trying to achieve different things, trying to get people who are used to digging up holes in the ground and putting in pieces of jib in the wall to understand how digital can really enable that business has been quite fun and quite challenging but you know what really works is getting out in the business with your hard hat on and your boots and talking to the people on the on the um, shop floor or talking to the customers that are rolling in in their truck and you know what are you doing here you don't look like you should be on the on the floor <laughs> having conversations with people and understanding what they're trying to do. And it's not just wanting to know who they are, but it's really understanding how we fit into their work and their life and what it is that we're doing that's helping them or hindering them. And one of the, the applications that we created was a specification tool for one of our Australian businesses. They're an insulation business and they had a team of four people who would create these specifications for insulation for their, their architects and specifiers who wanted a specification to put into their consenting process. And it would take them two or three weeks to create this specification. It's really complex, a lot of maths, a lot of standards, a lot of information that has to come into it. And we managed to boil that down into a very simple app that they were able to download themselves from the app store. They are now able to do all of those specifications themselves. Instead of doing four or five specifications a month, we are now doing 400 specifications a month. And that app, which cost us about 70 grand to make, has generated over a million and a half of EBIT in the time that it's been launched, and it's continuing to add value. But what we did differently with that application, we didn't just put it on the app store and say, you go download it, here you go. We actually went and engaged with our customers and said, well, we've got this new tool that can probably help you, and here's how it works, and here's how you get um, involved, and here's some training. For a lot of people in the building community, technology can be quite intimidating. You know, they don't necessarily use technology in their, in their day to day. For, it's not true for everyone, but for a big chunk of our, the people that we engage with. So we had to handhold them through that process and really manage the onboarding of the people onto that technology. We've, we had another example where a customer said, we want an app because our competitors have got one. So, oh, that's great. <laughs> So we went out and we talked to their customers and said, what are you trying to do? How would, um, how would this kind of technology work for you? And by the way, how, how is this technology that your, um, our competitor is using? And they said, well, we've, I know they've got that app, but we don't use it. Because if we send in a fax, you know, and if there's an error, well, the company takes accountability for that. If I use this tool, there's no question that I, you know, about whether I made a mistake or not. So I take accountability for it. So we don't use it. And it's like, well, how do you get around that? You know, it's really about understanding what it is that's getting in the way of that adoption as well and how you can incentivise people to actually use the innovations that you're creating. And on that note, I'll hand back to you, Wendy. Okay, thank you very much. <laughs> okay, so now we get into the gritty part of the conversation. Great, this. I'll sit down so I don't feel like I'm being too school Um I'm going to start off with some questions. I'm sure you've all got questions as well. And in fact, I know you have because I saw them when you RSVP'd. And it was wonderful to see the level of uh, interest in this topic. So the question I have is, you know, we hear a lot about innovation. And then we hear about not wanting to ruin the business. Um, Chris, you use much more colourful language than that. <laughs> and so how do you balance the need to keep on, I guess, growing, testing things out, risking failure, but ensuring that the, the solid business stays solid? So who'd like to start with that? I can, I can give it a go. 
I think it's really important to um, test. So don't do a really big test, do a really little test and figure out what, it, what your objective is, of course, and your hypotheses, and then um, make a little test and then see what the feedback is. So an example of that would be, um, we're working on something at the moment which is around helping people with retirement, for example. Um, instead of building the software from end to end and then doing the bigger unveil, what I did is I did some sketches um, using a very basic tool and then started using that to start a conversation to be able to get people to think about it and also to get um, end user feedback on whether or not it's a good idea. By doing that, I know, okay, does it have legs or doesn't it have legs? If it doesn't have legs, it's probably a sure path to failure. If it does have legs, then, well, what I'll do is I'll grow it a little bit more. I'll invest a little bit more time around that. And so then in each stage, I do it like a, a layer and layering of a cake. And as I build it up, it gets a richer and richer experience around it. Um, and at each layer, I just keep checking with people internally and externally, is this a thing? And then with that, it means that you're more likely to be able to get the bad ideas out quickly without little effort. And then you've got um, the good ideas, um, you're, you're putting the investment in, so you're likely to get some money <coughs> and some return back for it. Yeah. Great, thank you, so it's a yeah. long process. It doesn't have to be, like I can do a sketch in 20 minutes and then start talking to people. I think it's, um, when you timetable everything, it becomes a very long process. I think if you have the room to be able to just do, then it can be a very fast process. So having that space is really important. And having that connection to customers, which is what Chris was talking about, is super important as well, because otherwise, who can you ask for the feedback? Great, thank you. Anyone else like to comment? Well, I, I guess in my experience, the, another technique you can try is establishing, if it's a bigger disruption, establishing a completely separate brand that has no visible connection to the mother company can be a good way to, to start and, and evolve that organisation until such time as you can perhaps <coughs> bring it in and perhaps Chris might have seen that happen at, at Telecom. Uh, look, I think knowing customers intimately, uh, testing fast but safely, and particularly when you think about the food industry, um, you know, getting that wrong is not good. Um, uh, and, and having very good responsive feedback loops. So for us, innovation cycles can be 24 hours. Something can go out, get a customer reaction, carry on or not carry on. Uh, so I think that breaking it down into little chunks, the making sure there was a customer reason you tried it at all, uh, and being very clear about how you're gonna measure success and measure outcome and that you're going to engage customers. You know, what you, it's funny, Microsoft have done this for 100 years, right? They, they put out unfinished product, we all test it, report the bugs, and they bring out another one and another one. You know, and it's just, we've, we've got very used to that. Um, so I think there's just so much uh, about that customer engagement and beta testing and doing it with them. Great, thank you. I never knew that was Microsoft's strategy. <laughs> <laughs> um, a question I have, because you've talked, everyone's talked about people <coughs> and culture. So how do you inspire your leaders and your organisations to really ensure that their teams and their staff are up for the change? I think it's just listen to people and respond to their suggestions. From my point of view, it's really about a servant leadership style and it's really about being humble and putting things out there but en enabling people to pull the, the new ideas and the new ways of working and being very careful not to <coughs> polarise people with your, your language. Some of the language that is you know, evolved from the sort of agile lean customer centric ways of working, those words in themselves can be extremely polarising because if you're not familiar with it, you immediately think, oh, I don't know what that means, so you, you're on the back foot. So trying to dumb down the language or, or simplify it, no, you know, to stop using weasel words is a really good start. Um, I think what's really important is a lot of people uh, have vague ideas what innovation is. Um, you know, as was suggested, we all have different interpretations of it. 
Um, often, I think uh, uh, people talk a little bit in terms of vaporware, what um, innovation is and what it can deliver. So, in terms of leadership across the bank, I think we try to make it as real as possible. Um, we have a lot of kind of you know beautiful process people. They love systems and they love infrastructure and they love a, a method. And um, and so what we've done is really really reinforce the fact that innovation isn't accidental. It is can be quite systematic, it is quite methodical, there are algorithms that kind of make it work and we point out very clearly what those algorithms are. So for all of those process people across the bank, they go, right, I get it, I can cling to the formula, I get what you're trying to do, it's not just a kind of an accidental creative process. And if it is, there's a system for bringing that creative accidental anomalies into the business as well and capturing them and kind of working through with them. I will add one since the other three have gone. Um, <laughs> it's storytelling, it's taking people along a journey. And I think when we talk to the executive team internally inside PwC, um, we have to realise that they don't know everything that we know. And so it does mean that we need to elaborate. We can't just show them something that we actually have to talk them through and explain what the potential outcomes are. And uh, yeah, I think storytelling is the key. Great, thank you. So now, who's got questions from the floor? Hi Chris, um, the question for me was working in a new culture of a cooperative, mm -hmm. and I guess the need to create change, but at the same time initiate that change across what is a relatively popular landscape. Can you talk a bit about how you brought the cooperative members into the process of having to make rapid decisions? Uh, look, I think you know, everyone says, oh, you work at a cooperative, how's that? Um, expecting you to declare some new disease. Um, <laughs> I, no, the, two or three observations. The first one is a cooperative is the ultimate quality filter. Because there is a danger in corporates that bosses can say, do this because it's their personal belief and people follow blindly. Uh, whereas in a cooperative, you just get a fairly, you know, on a good day you get a hand up, on a, another day you get a digit. Um, but, but, you know, the cooperative model where people go, I know that's not right for my customers, so I'm not doing it, is a fantastic quality lifter, you know, because it really just, you know, the end, I keep talking to my team because I quite often have conversations where they come and say, I've got this great idea and the stores just won't do it. And the first question is, is it a great idea? You know, how do you know it's a great idea and, and, and what's the story you're telling with that and all those things? Um, so that's the first thing. Second thing is cooperative is all about just getting two things in perfect balance, which we never get perfect, but you just got to keep thinking about. And the first one is agility of decision making. So when is it in the hands of the leadership team I've chosen to appoint and pay to do a job versus depth of consultation? When should you slow down and deeply consult and make sure you take the learning and the, the view of all of the cooperative shareholders, the owners of our company? Um, so just getting that right, agility and that. Uh, you know, the, the number, we sell about 30% more per square metre than our main competitor. There is something in the intensity of owner manager that makes that happen. Hi folks, I'm Andy. Uh, previously worked for Taustra Corporation, did paint a pitch, it was 49,000 staff. It was a true global. We ran two internal incubators for our own staff, no own development. Two of my customers are sitting here, Fletcher's, and of course the Commonwealth ASB, curiously. Uh, my question to you folks is how, does, how do your organisations or do your organisations currently mine the ideas of your staff? Do you mine and catch them? And Lee, you made a very good point. Management and leadership and you know, pretty strong corporates tends to be very waterfall, top down, bottom up, and quite restrictive because no one wants to be seen to be cleverer than their manager. Um, so how do you, your organisations go about that? In Taustra, we turned it into a game, but I'll share that after the discussion of how we actually did that. Shall I start? <laughs> so in Fletcher's, we really value the ideas of anyone at any level. And when we launched the Innovation Lab, it was very much about how do we get ideas from everyone into our pipeline of ideas to process. We've processed maybe over 800 ideas, maybe more. Um, and you know, of that, we've only delivered 26 of those ideas into actually working um, solutions. But the way that we do that is a, in three different ways. One, we had workshops with all of the, the general managers to firstly get them inspired, and we explained all the different options and 
um, the possibilities, show demos and all of that kind of stuff. But at the end of every workshop, it was an ideation session. So here's a business challenge. Since you're in the room, let's ideate on what you might want to, to do to solve some of these challenges. And then we do those same workshop type formats at every level in the organisation, but it's a pool model. Who wants to us to come in and run that kind of workshop? We also do strategy sessions where we look at a particular business problem, a business process, and look for the opportunities across there, all of the pain points, and look for the opportunity to solve that. And we also have the ability on our internet for anyone to submit an idea. And we've had a lot of ideas through that, that channel. And then just generally getting out into the business and explaining and showcasing what we're doing is also encouraging other people to put up ideas. And some of the ideas are coming from people on the shop floor, people who are just um, working in a, a cleaning role. There's all sorts of different ideas that come through. And we take every one of those ideas seriously. But we always put the question back to them, you know, what problem are you trying to solve? And how, what value do you think there is in actually solving this problem? And through that conversation, you really start to understand more about what, what the problem is. But when, then we don't take it at face value. We then go out and engage with customers or people who are impacted by that problem to really dig into what that is. And a lot of times you find the actual problem is quite different to what they assume it was. Mm -hmm. Thanks. So we try and democratise um, the ideation process as much as possible and the innovation process across the bank. We do that through <coughs> platforms and so on. So we're using at the moment a tool called Spigot. Some of you might have heard about it. There's Crowdicity. There's a whole bunch of them. Um, where pretty much the crowd votes the ideas up or down. So someone, we put a challenge out to the business um, and that's usually that challenge is strategically aligned. It's come from the leadership and I'm about to present, I'm about to go to our leadership today actually to ask for the next challenge. Um, to put out to the business, that puts a sh that shines a light on a particular area where the bank wants to focus, and then we allow the bank to respond right across the business. So 5,000 people have the opportunity to submit their ideas, and then 5,000 people have the opportunity to then decide which are the ones that are worth investing and have merit. So we try and take um, panel decisions, we try and take um, middle management decision making out of the process and we let the kind of the whole business decide where um, you know what gets up in terms of where the light is shining for the bank um, in terms of its strategy. From there we um, uh, we're going through a process now we've just kicked off or we're in the middle of a pilot we'll do another one um, towards the end of the year where we are running a mini accelerator inside the house um, where those where people have been selected have put their hands up off the basis that they submitted an idea that was popular with the community, um, that they've gone through a series of hack fests and things to show that they're resilient and they're robust and they're resourceful. Um, we've extracted them out of the business and now they are kind of running their own their own ventures, for want of a better word. And we the first opening statement of that cohort when they kicked off is I don't care if you're GM, you're head of, you're grand level titles go out the door now. You are founders of a venture and you work together equally. So we've got five teams who are running through. One of those teams has actually been run by a grad who's just literally stepped out of university. She's taken on board that she's the CEO and she's got kind of a, a senior level manager now that she's sort of saying, right, we're going to do this, we're doing that. She's giving the direction to that, that particular venture. So we've, we've taken the high, or we've attempted, you know, we're, we're trying to get through some hurdles with it, but we've attempted to take hierarchy out and allow people to actually use their natural skills, their resourcefulness, their ability to deal with ambiguity, that sometimes that wouldn't come through if they were kind of in a, a hierarchical title position within the bank. That's great. What great answers. Thank you. So we need to close now because it's 8.30 and I appreciate that some of you have probably got 9 o'clock meetings to get back to. Before we close, I just want to sum up with probably the four things that have really struck for me if you want to create innovation successfully in corporates. And interestingly, they all start with C. The first one is courage. And it really is courage to uh, take a new idea, to really risk failure and the consequences of that. The next one, of course, is culture. And we've heard today how important it is to really get people on board to empower them to have the ideas, and particularly if you've just heard of ASB, how they even vote on the ideas that go forward. Then customers. How close are you to your customers? What are their problems that you have to solve to innovate? And I think we heard from Chris about being able to walk into a mock-up store on polystyrene. That's pretty cool. And that is a real 4D experience. 
And then lastly, you have to create value. We talk about innovation being an idea with impact, and I think all of us would agree that New Zealand is a fantastic at coming up with ideas and inventions, but I think there's a gap to go before we really commercialise at the same rate as we come up with these ideas. So please join me in thanking all of the people